I was the one who was going to lead this particular day, so I strategically planned out um, two extremely cool presentations for you all. Um, the first is by Jessica D'Ambrosio. Uh, she's the Western Lake Erie Basin Agriculture Project Director. I don't meet many people with a longer title than I have, but she wins. Um, and she's with the Nature Conservancy. Um, so Jessica is going to talk to you about foreign nutrient management today. And I also asked her to give just a brief overview, um, starting off on kind of how she got to where she is today, and hopefully inspire all of you. coming tonight. I appreciate it. It's a good crowd. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Nature Conservancy is the largest conservation organization in the world. Uh, this crowd might have heard of the Nature Conservancy. I usually talk to a lot of farmers and agribusinesses that haven't heard of the Nature Conservancy. Um, so we're in all 50 states in the United States, and we're in almost 70 countries worldwide. Uh, we have about 4,000 scientists on staff, but we also have policy people, government relations, philanthropy, communications, kind of anything you can think of, we, we hire and we staff those. Um, I don't get to do a lot of the research anymore that I used to do, but I get to work with the folks, the really smart folks that are doing the research and put the pieces together so that the research that you guys are doing gets translated well enough to the people who need it, and that spurs them to do behavior changes that protect water quality in the Lake Erie watershed. Uh, my background, I am a, a poster child for a windy and heavily branching pathway in my career. So if you don't know what you want to do yet or exactly where you want to be, it's okay. You're going to turn out okay. <laughs> um, so I have a background in wildlife and fishery science, in environmental science focused on hydrology, and in agriculture engineering. So I kind of have one foot in engineering and one foot in sciences. And it, um, it helps out a lot to be able to communicate with different types of people and have a little bit of just enough knowledge on each side to be able to understand and translate information back and forth between people, especially as we're talking about implementing projects on the ground, explaining the benefit of projects, and then really explaining the impact of those projects to people who um, give the money, the bankers, um, so to understand why it's important and that it works. So I'm going to caveat my presentation by saying I'm going to present research that I haven't collected. So there's always inherent dangers with that um, in that I didn't do the analysis in the lab. I didn't go out and collect the data samples. And so if you're going to ask the hard questions, don't ask them to me. Uh, only ask the easy ones to me. <laughs> Um, and so this data is important. The research that I'm going to present is about 4R nutrient management. Have you guys heard of this concept, 4Rs? Okay. So I, get, I work with agriculture mostly um, in the Western Lake Erie Basin. I work with agribusinesses, farmers directly, um, those that represent farmers, those that advise farmers, um, soil and water conservation districts. And while you guys are here at the lake and focused on research at the lake, I focus on research at the, t at the headwaters of the lake. So all that stuff that's happening that ends up at the lake, I'm working at the other end trying to get people to change their behavior so they send less bad stuff down to the lake. And one of the strategies, and that's why my title is A Solution, not the Solution um, to, nutri to algal blooms, is nutrient management. And so one might consider that a one of the source issues. So if we can reduce the amount of phosphorus and nitrogen getting to the water in the first place, we may have a shot at reducing the overall occurrence of the bloom. Okay. Uh, oh, I should say, that, my, that picture in the middle, that's what I did my PhD research on. They're called heat safe dishes. So retrofitting drainage dishes to function more like natural streams, but still have a drainage I'm not presenting on that work. <laughs> I think this will be more relevant. So here's a nice schematic of the four R's of nutrient management. Um, so essentially this idea is based on nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium. All of those elements are nutrients. They're not pollutants until they get to the wrong place where we don't want them to be. They start off as essential nutrients for all life to 
grow, including plants. And so they're really vital for agriculture because we can't grow crops without enough nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium in our soils to feed the growing crop. And we're doing it at such an intensity that we need an abundance of those materials to just to grow the crop. And there's been decades and decades of research on how and how much and what amount of those fertilizers, those nutrients that are needed to grow the best crop, to grow the most food that we can. But there's been recognition, obviously, that these things, when we use too much of them, when they're used in the wrong place at the wrong time, that they could cause some really bad problems for the environment. Case in point, right here at Lake Erie and the algal blooms that we're having. We're not alone in this issue. Anywhere around the world, um, high nutrient problems, um, eutrophication is having algal blooms. Uh, we just happened to make some <laughs> some of the bigger headlines <laughs> recently. So, um, and we are one of the Great Lakes, so we are not alone. We, we call them the Three Green Sisters, Lake Erie, Saginaw Bay, and uh, Green Bay. We're all facing similar nutrient issues with watersheds that are predominantly agriculture. And so agriculture, given the, the land use base, it's around 80, 85 to 89% of the land use of the surrounding watershed is agriculture land use. We know that agriculture uses that nitrogen and phosphorus to grow crops, and so therefore it's the leading contributing source of the algal blooms in Lake Erie. So that's why we're focused on it. So all of this research got translated into four principles of nutrient management. Put the right source of nutrients at the right place in the right time and the right amount. And so the Nature Conservancy got together with agribusinesses, Ohio State Extension, a whole group of people, multiple stakeholders, and said, let's use this to protect water quality, this concept. So they we started a program called the 4-Hour Nutrient Stewardship Certification Program, and it was a program that agribusinesses so, and people who advise farmers on how much fertilizer to apply could sign up for this program and say, okay, we're going to make sure that we follow these 45 standards, that you're, we're going to guarantee that you're using the right source, you're doing it in the right place, it's at the right time, and you're using the right amount. And it's a third-party audited system, um, so it's verified. Um, each year, and so we thought that was, that's a great idea to start tackling this, these algal bloom problems that we're having. The program got started and, well, started planning in 2012, was launched in 2014, and guess what happened in 2014? Who remembers? Who's from here? Yeah, so Toledo lost their water for a couple of days due to algal blooms. Um, so this program had just launched, and luckily for us, from a social science standpoint or political standpoint, the agribusinesses had already come to the table and said, we want to step up and do something about this. So they, once the crisis happened, they were already in place and the relationships were already built. So that's one thing to remember. It's not just about the science. It's about how does your science bring people together and how can they agree on a policy that um, further or is based on your science and your results. Okay, so here's just some real quick stats on where we are with the program. It started here in the Western Lake Erie Basin, so the whole watershed wide that includes Indiana and Michigan. And that started in 2014. We expanded out to all of Ohio because Ohio River is having some algal bloom problems too, not just Lake Erie. Um, so that expanded in 2017. We have 48 individual facilities or retailers that are certified now. Um, in Ohio in the Western Lake Erie Basin, and they manage, they're responsible for advising on and applying fertilizer on nearly 3 million acres of land. So that's quite a bit of land, right? So that's what we want. We want to make sure that the people that are giving the advice and doing the application are doing it in that for our way, that responsible, sustainable way that still grows crops but doesn't apply so much and at the wrong time that it causes algal blooms. Again, we have 45 standards. We added nitrogen because it's not just a phosphorus problem even though phosphorus is a, is a leading contributor. Um, and then a tie to this, which is a little unique, so it's not just good enough, oh, we're going to have a program, people are going to sign up, we're going to say we did it, you get your badge, you get your sign. Uh, we want people to also, we want to know if it works. Is doing this, is doing the four R's, is managing your nutrients in the right way on your farm fields really going to result in uh, benefits to Lake Erie and reductions in the algal blooms? Um, so there is a research component to that, and that's what I'm going to present today. And you can learn more about the program at this website, for our certified.org if you're interested. Okay, so here's where all of the certified facilities are. You can see they're mainly concentrated in the Western Lake Erie Basin, and they're ranging from individual one or two mom-and-pop shops all the way to the giant crop production services that is a national 
large corporations. So we want to get as many people involved as possible. Um, okay, so we're, here are the stats. So we've got about, depending on what map you look at and depending on the year, we've got about 5.2 to 5.5 million acres of farmed land in the Western Lake Erie Basin. The total basin is around 7 million acres, so it's quite a bit. We have a goal for the program of getting 80% of those acres under the certified management. So knowing that 80% of the acres are putting on their nutrients in the right way, uh, we think will go a lot towards reducing algal bloom. And we're, and we're about halfway there right now. So we've got some work to do. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later on in the presentation. So here's the research. It's funded by the 4R Research Fund. And it's really to evaluate the three Ps. So think about sustainability, profit, planet, people, um, the three Ps of the 4Rs. <laughs> uh, so if we can add another letter, we probably would. Uh, we probably will in the future. But is this program working? Is, and is it working in the fact of, can we see the impact of reducing nutrients or managing them more sustainably at the edge of the farm field? Uh, can we model those impacts so we know that we have a, we know when and to how much extent that implementing these practices will make a difference? And how do we know that people are actually changing their behavior, not just saying they're going to do something, but actually doing it? And how many of those people do we need to be on board with this? And then, we're, and then it has an outreach and education component to it. Uh, it's a five-year project. We're in the last year of that project right now. You can see there's a ton of things that are going to be done and have been done. And we've already published quite a few papers on that. Um, it's based, the monitoring part of the project is based on 19 paired watersheds, paired field studies, and they kind of look like this. So there's a water quality, a continuous water quality sampling station at each one of the fields. Um, it's paired next to a field. So one field is a treatment, one field is a control. These are real working private land farms. So it's the real world out there. It's not just a laboratory setting or a plot study, although we have one of those. And we're measuring both the surface flows from those farm fields and the subsurface flows. So Probably close to 85, 90% of our fields, our land is, is subsurface drained in this part of the world. We used to be a big swamp here. If we didn't have that drainage under the ground, we would be a swamp again. Um, and so the only way to do farming and to do development in this part of the world is to have drainage. Uh, it turns out that subsurface drainage is also a good pathway for nutrients to leave the field and get to Lake Erie. Um, some of the treatments that we're doing, so we're doing all, each of the four R's. Uh, some of them are done separately at some of the locations. Some are done in combination. And then we're also, four R's aren't the only solution that farmers have or the only way that we can reduce nutrient losses from farm fields. So it's a range of doing um, different types of soil health management like tillage, different types of water management, holding back water in the soil profile, crop rotations, all those filters, all those we're studying all of those different types of methods or strategies that farmers have available to them to keep nutrients from leaving the farm field or filter the water when it leaves the farm field. We also have one study for one of the four R's, the uh, placement of the, um, the right location. Um, and that is, a, that is more of a plot-based study because we wanted to determine different placement of fertilizer within the soil profile versus Top. It's really hard to do in a working farm system, so we have a smaller plot scale study that's underway. It just started this year. Um, okay, so what are some of the answers that we're getting? Well, based on the data that we know from NOAA and from Sea Grant and Heidelberg University, who's done some continuous water sampling, we know that when we have large amount of rainfall during the year, we have, tend to have larger blooms. When we have less rainfall, we have smaller blooms. So we observe that. Um, we see it in the data. So the researchers want to say, can we see that effect at the edge of the field as well? Um, and so what is the effect really on rainfall amount and intensity on the, the ability of these nutrients to move off of the farm field? So that's what we want to stop in the first place. So what they found was looking at both surface flow and subsurface flow, those are the two transport pathways, that rainfall amount was the strongest driver of surface runoff events. So how much rain you got really determined how much left the farm field through surface runoff, okay? Probably a no-brainer, but we didn't actually have data from the farm <laughs> to prove that, right? Um, something that we could probably guess is the reason why. What was a real surprise was how much 
was actually coming out of the subsurface tile. So about 50% of our phosphorus was coming out of the subsurface tile. We didn't think any was coming out of the subsurface tile to begin with. So we did find that there is some coming out. And what, what drives the subsurface tile flow is more seasonal rainfall, not the overall amount of rainfall, so when it happens. Um, and it also depends on what has already happened before. So if you get a rainfall event, but it hasn't rained for three or four weeks before that, it's probably not going to result in a, in a subsurface event, but it could likely result in a surface event. Whereas if it rains steadily for days and days and then we get a bigger event, um, you're going to have both. Um, okay, So we need to know when and at what point the runoff events happen and what pathway it goes through. That also has implications because when we talk about phosphorus, it's not just phosphorus. Phosphorus isn't phosphorus. There's total phosphorus, and total phosphorus is made up of particulate phosphorus. That's the stuff that ties to the soil particles that we can kind of see. And then we have the dissolved phosphorus, and that's the stuff we can't see. And both are causing major problems in Lake Erie. And actually now we see a decline in total phosphorus or in particulate phosphorus in Lake Erie or causing the algal blooms, and an increase in the dissolved and so they, so knowing where and when each type of phosphorus leaves is important to understanding how we then apply nutrients to our farm fields. Okay, so again, the surface runoff events are most likely to occur in the autumn, um, and the event size is not strongly correlated to season. So we can get a big storm any time of the year. We most likely get them in this area in the fall. Guess what happens in the fall? We do a lot of harvesting in the fall. And we also do some applying of nitrogen and some, some, a little bit of phosphorus. So we do some application of nutrients in the fall. Maybe that might not be the best time to surface apply um, a fertilizer, for example, so that we can use this information and then make decisions, help people make decisions about when and where to apply nutrients. Um, it's kind of the opposite with the subsurface. This has significant seasonal effects. So the subsurface discharge is lowest in the fall. So it's kind of the opposite of the surface flow and highest in the spring. Well, what happens in the spring when we farm? Well, that's when we're planting. That's when we're putting on most of our fertilizer for the year. That's when we're doing our tillage. Um, so we're really doing a lot of activity in the spring. And so we may not want to, if we're talking about the placement of phosphorus, we may not want to put it under the ground because we're, that's the most likely time that we're going to lose it through the subsurface pathway. Okay, so that's how we can translate information that we find into helping make management decisions related to the four R's. Okay. You guys with me? All right, charts. Let's do a research tab without charts. Okay, so let me orient you to this. So these dotted lines on the horizontal axis are our Annex 4, so our mandated reductions that we are to meet by 2025. Um, we, not every site meets those, but that's what we're supposed to get to, and that's supposed to reduce the severity of the blooms um, one out of ten, every 10 years uh, compared to the 2008 level. Did I get that right? Mostly right. Okay. Um, what's on the uh, y-axis here, the vertical axis, is so all of these recommendations and all this research translates to a set of what we call tri-state fertilizer recommendations. So everybody follows this published guideline of how much you should apply and when for a growing crop. Okay. So crops can be in the or soils can be in the buildup range. What that means is that you don't have enough nutrients in your soil to grow the crop that you want to grow, so you need to add more. You can be right in the maintenance range, which is right in the middle, and that's you're perfect. You're spot on. You're applying exactly what you need for the growing crop that you want to grow. Or you can be in the drawdown phase, which is you have way too much fertilizer in your soil, more than the crop could ever use. You, you don't need to apply anymore. Okay? So you can see, based on our study site, we're kind of all over the board here, right? So we have some that are that are pretty high, and we have some that are pretty low. Um, so what does this what does this say about environmental risk? Does every time you put fertilizer on to the farm field, is it going to result in an algal bloom? Well, this chart is kind of saying not necessarily. So if you have way too high, yes, the chances are that if it rains and it's in the soil, you're going to lose it, and it's going to cause a problem. And a crop, there's no crop there to take it up, or the crop is taking up what it needs. So if you're way too high in the highest end of the range, yes, your risk is the highest. So you need to do something about managing this. You need to either not apply at all, apply less, or 
um, you need to do something else to stop that nutrient from leaving. But the soil test P, or the soil test that we take that tells us how much phosphorus is in the soil, doesn't always, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship with environmental risk, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, so for example, look at these sites. They have, they're well below our, our target levels, even. So these guys are doing a really good job of how they manage their nutrient, but their loss is really high. So they have a higher environmental risk, even though in the soil it shows that they don't have um, they don't have a lot of phosphorus. So why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons why. One could be um, soil type, soil slope, runoff risk. So there's a lot of talk now about policy to mandate soil testing, which I think is a good policy because you don't know how much you need to apply to a field until you know what your soils tell you you need, right? So your soils tell you how much you're going to need for that crop. If you don't know what you have by doing a soil test, you don't know how much to apply. You could just throw out anything, and you have no idea whether you're going to get a good food crop or a bad crop or if it's going to leave the field. So you, can't, you should do a soil test, but you shouldn't assume that just because your soil test is low, it doesn't mean that you don't, you're, you're free and clear, you're not going to have a risk. So you also have to probably do an assessment of what's my risk? What, are, what is my erosion potential? What it, should I not be applying in the spring or fall? Should I be applying it, just broadcasting it, or putting it under the surface? So that's just one of the four R's. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind. What's also when we talk about policy is the science is telling us a blanket policy could have some unintended consequences, and we just have to be aware of that. And not all farm fields, look at the scatter on this data, not all farm fields behave the same way. OK, so that's for particulate phosphorus. It's easy to understand particulate phosphorus from a soil phosphorus test or get some clues about it. But dissolved phosphorus, is, it doesn't show up on a test like that because it dissolves in solution. So what do we do? So the researchers decided they were going to look at um, look at stratification of the soil. So the phosphorus is in the soil, it stays in the soil, but is it stuck at the surface? Is it down a couple of inches or is it way down, like a couple of feet? Where, how does it move through the soil profile and does that affect how it moves off through the soil profile and out of the farm field? Um, and so what they found was in all the research sites that they had a medium level of stratification. That means that there was phosphorus found not just at the very top, but also throughout the soil column in the top eight inches of soil. So phosphorus was kind of everywhere in there, right? Um, so what happens if we look at the sites, though, based on whether they're in the maintenance range or build-up range. And you can see it doesn't really matter. So if you have a phosphorus deficit, you still have stratification in your soil, meaning there's access to phosphorus for water, dissolved phosphorus, that could leave your farm field. And if you're in the drawdown phase, which is you're way too high phosphorus levels in your soil test, you still have the same risk or the same amount of phosphorus in the soil profile. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's why we can't quite equate one-to-one -one soil test with environmental risk. So this is an area of research. If you guys are interested in soils and interested in phosphorus and nutrient reduction, there's only been a couple of studies. Baker and all uh, last year released a study. There's an unpublished study from USDA ARS. There's this work. But there's not a lot of information about the severity of stratification of nutrients in the soil and what effect that has on environmental risk. Okay, so here's some methodology. Again, I did not do this research, so I'll let you read through this. So relating that stratification issue to that first thing I talked about, which was the rainfall intensity or the event intensity. So when, is, when do we have the risk of phosphorus losses? Um, let's give you a second to read through that. A lot of statistics. Okay, so what they came up with was a bunch of graphs that looked like a mess, right? So what are these really saying? <laughs> so they're looking at the soil test phosphorus, the stratification, stratification in the top two inches of the soil, and then the top eight inches of the soil, right, or two to eight inches. And they looked at surface flow events and subsurface flow events that we talked about. And so what they found was as the discharge in millimeters, as the discharge increases in the surface runoff, so the more surface runoff you have, the relationship between dissolved phosphorus and soil test P level that you get from a lab goes down. That means things get kind of messy. 
okay? And the size of the event influences the dissolved reactive loss more than the soil test number tells you. So if you get a soil test, you can't just rely on the soil test for dissolved reactive phosphorus. You have to look at the size of the event, when it occurs, and how much discharge is in there. So that's why a blanket statement about your soil test has to be 12 may, may be a policy that has some unintended consequences, especially when it comes to dissolved reactive phosphorus. Okay, for tile drains, it's the opposite relationship, of course. Um, so as the, as the discharge increases in the tile drainage, the dissolved reactive phosphorus has a better relationship with the soil test level. So for tile drainage losses, we can use the soil test and have a better idea of what the loss is. So how do you manage that on one farm when you have a surface and you do all your work at the surface, but you have water and nutrient moving both over the surface and under the tile. And that's what we get tasked to try to figure out. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> okay. And so then the complicating factor is each flow path transport dissolved reactive phosphorus differently. So it could go through the soil profile, it could get into the tile drains, it could kind of just slowly seep out. It, it gets kind of messy when it's in the soil. Okay. So the other thing that they looked at was, well, how do we know how much phosphorus we have? So everybody asked that question. How much do we have? Um, and so they do a simple mass balance on the farm fields. And so everyone kind of tends to think we have these big algal blooms. We have a major problem going on. Everyone's just dumping as much fertilizer as they possibly can. Everybody's just doing it wrong. We need to stop this. That's not the case. And we have the, we have the research to show that. I wish that were the case because that would be really easy. Okay, so what we find over the total of our field sites is we have a net P balance of three acres, so a positive balance of three pounds per acre. So if you think about three pounds per acre, three pounds is about a mason jar full of phosphorus, leaving every acre, right? That's not dumping and dumping and dumping. We have to find three pounds in every acre and we have to remove three pounds. That's what's causing the algal bloom. And that was happening only on about 63, and about 63% of the fields had a negative balance. So not all the fields had way too much phosphorus coming from those. So we had to find the right fields, and then we had to find that mason jar amount and stop that, okay? But all of the sites had hydrologic pathways, had water carrying phosphorus away from it. So water, managing water is just as important as managing nutrients. That's what this data showed that we didn't, we weren't able to prove before, but we kind of thought that was the case. And then we thought, well, it's just, our, it's just our study sites. There's a lot of bad actors out there. We, we know that there's bad actors. Well, we got some data from the International Plant Nutrition Institute, and they said Lake Erie-wide, Western Basin-wide, we see the overall crop balances. Yields have gone up over the years, which is great. That's what farmers want to see. But the phosphorus removal that's happened has gone down. So we're more efficient with our use of phosphorus, and overall we're doing a better job managing the phosphorus, um, and we actually, most of our fields across the basin have a deficit of phosphorus. So we need to find this, like, small amount off of every acre or off of just the key acres. And we don't know which ones those are, and we need to stop that. So that's a big problem that we have, and that's why we're still having a lot of blooms. Another thing this study found was this is the synthetic or commercial fertilizer. Look at the manure. The manure stayed the same. So I hear a lot of headlines, especially coming out of, some newspapers that manure is the problem. If we fix, if we stop manure, we'll get rid of this problem. The manure impact hasn't changed over 27 years. Not saying that we shouldn't still control manure, but it's one of those sources that has to be managed in the 4R way. Okay, so the study also looked at swap modeling, and so what they tried to do was we have a lake-wide or basin-wide uh, swap model to tell us what. Ag, what agriculture BMP scenarios we have, we should be doing, and then what amount should we be adopting them to reach our 40% reduction goal? What we don't know is how that translates to at the edge of each field or every farm field. What do they need to be doing to do their own reduction? And then what happens at the farm field and what happens at the lake? In between that is a lot of space, and right now it's kind of a big black box. We have no idea. Well, I shouldn't say no idea. We have a lot of ideas about what could be happening in between those two things, and we need to figure out how to sync those up. And we're doing that in this project through modeling, uh, swap modeling. 
This is also the team that put together a 3D model that helps uh, develop the algal bloom forecast tools. Um, so you'll see this NOAA bulletin, and maybe you'll talk about that, I don't know. Um, so we'll see this NOAA bulletin. They developed the model. So we have pretty good confidence that we have the right team of people together to do this. They're working on it right now, and hopefully by next year they'll have some, some answers for us about what that black box is and how the four R's at the farm scale can help us predict what the blooms will be. Okay. Um, so then the last piece of this is a social science survey. Um, and so basically based on, compared to 20, 2011 when they surveyed the same farmers, and this was a survey of 1,500 farmers in the basin, look at these numbers about awareness and knowledge of what algal blooms are, the importance of nutrients, the importance of water quality. These were in the 20% range in 2011. So the outreach and education that all of the partners in this basin have done has, has been working. Does that translate to behavior? Not necessarily, right? So that's what we need to do. So we know that farmers are willing, so we can see as, the, as time goes on, knowledge increases, they're more willing to adopt things. We see the numbers moving in the positive direction. They're reporting that they're willing to adopt. Quite a few numbers are willing to adopt. Uh, we need to figure out, as the people that work with them, what is the carrot going to be? What's the incentive going to be to get them to act? They say they want to do it. They say they understand the problem. How do we get them to, to turn, right? So that's what we're working on now. And then what we also found was that, oh, the more educated they are, the wealthier they are, the more likely they are to do conservation. That's not true. What we actually found with our farmers was their perceived efficacy was the main driver for why they would make a behavior change. So efficacy is both, am I confident that I could do this practice and I could figure this out on my own field? And am I confident that this practice will actually work? It's those two things together. So we need to do a better job in our outreach and communications of showing the science that these things do work and then helping them along the way to make the changes that happen. And then we looked at different types of practices they could do, not just the four R's. Uh, we also have some classes that anyone who applies fertilizer, this is, a, this is a law now, that anyone who applies a fertilizer has to go to a three-hour certification course. And then the four R program is expanding to many other states, so we're not just the only ones doing it. Um, so the four R concept has some validity and merit. And then what are the conclusions? We know that the farmers understand the issue. We know they're willing to take action. We just have to figure out how to get them to make that move and what their carrot is going to be. Uh, we have evidence that the 4R nutrient management can work in reducing nutrient losses, but there are some serious trade-offs when it comes to weather patterns and how and when we apply fertilizers that we have to keep in mind. Um, and the 4Rs can help meet the 40% reduction goal, but if that's the only thing we do, we're not going to get there. We need to do a, a series of other things. This is just one piece of the overall set of solutions. And this is future research direction. So this is for you guys. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of work in soil health, soil um, biology. There's a lot of work in modeling that needs to be done, edge of field modeling, uh, swap modeling. Um, so there's a lot linking um, the export of nutrients to biotic integrity. We have no idea what the impact is on uh, what's living in the streams that are heading towards the lake. So there's a lot of areas of research, if you guys are interested in this field for your future, there's a lot of places where you can work. And I know I went over time, so thanks for being patient. And I don't know, do we have time for questions? Yeah. Okay.
really those are going to be those long-term, permanent places where you can catch your trip and store your trip. We have an acute problem happening right now, and this is going to take time as farming industry farmers shift over their practices and buy into this. It's not going to happen in one growing season. So in the meantime, we still have fertilizer coming down to the lake, and so we think things like riparian buffers, wetlands, uh, storage, surface storage, subsurface storage. Are Um, 
um, and don't make it too cumbersome and don't make it too expensive. So I don't, for them, I don't know that it matters whether it's a skip from nitrogen to phosphorus or an addition because they have to add both anyway. Um, and the 4Rs, you should be adding both in a similar way. Or if you're using manure, it should be the same way. Uh, manure and commercial fertilizers behave the same way if you, if you apply them consciously, right? So if you don't apply too much, you only put what you need, you only put it where you need it, and you only put it when you need it, they don't cause a problem for the environment. Um, so there's not been a lot of pushback in adding nitrogen standards. There's not, actually, some of the retailers that are part of the program, they want us to have potassium standards now, and they want us to have calcium standards. So, because they're seeing the tri-state recommendations are too high for potassium. So, I think I think it's good that people are starting to look at their soil tests. I think it's good that people are starting to ask questions about, wait a second, this level doesn't look high, this looks too high, this doesn't seem right. Because it gets them thinking about, what does my crop really need? It's a system. It's a living system. And if they're not putting in the right amount of nutrients for that system to thrive, then they're, they're going to fail. There's going to be a failure somewhere, whether that's bad soil, whether that's the environmental risk, or whether that's a poor crop. And I think technology and kind of um, innovation has kind of gotten us away from really thinking about the intricacies of our system, of these growing systems. And we just we can have a machine that almost drives itself now, and we have applicators that just throw things out there and um, so we just don't think about what the implications are for the balance of the nitrogen and the phosphorus. So it's just, that was a really long-winded answer, but more ph philosophical. I was Coming from the crop growing side, so it's not they're not complaining about it because it's causing a lot of quality problems. They're complaining about it because they're afraid that it's going to be impacting their yields a little bit. And there's this whole like this whole agronomy really focuses on the macro nutrients, which are like the big ones: you got nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. But there's all these micro nutrients that are that are part of the like magnesium, calcium. So there's a lot of folks that are tweaking the numbers a little bit, and they're realizing if you up your calcium magnesium ratio, you don't need the phosphorus and nitrogen anymore, for example. So maybe I'll add a little bit more calcium instead, <laughs> which is not a water quality thing. Um, and then I don't even need to add, worry about applying too much phosphorus because the calcium is changing the soil properties and holding phosphorus in place better or something. I'm not a chemist, so. <laughs> a lot of debate right now about the recommendations change. And they are under review right now and we're getting ready to be re-released. But um, a lot of people generally feel that the recommendations are too high. Um, it's, it's the hedging of risk of making sure that you can grow good crops. So it's not about, it's a little bit about money, but it's more about making sure that you can guarantee that your crop grows. Um, but that was also based in the bad diagnostic tools, we didn't have a lot of lab analyses, um, and we had a lot, like nearly 100% till ratio. Now we have something like 60% no-till, that changes the soil chemistry and that it changes the way that soil biology works, so you're not disrupting that. Um, and so the recommendations haven't changed to, to keep up with our diagnostic tools and also the way we <coughs> that should be debated and 
something as the future people in this field potentially, that's something we can work on and really um, blow the doors wide open. <laughs>
um, and is a very small organization. It still is, we only have three people um, at GLOSS, including myself, uh, that are staff full time. And the cube next to me was constantly rotating it. Seemed. So I really had to be very flexible and take on a lot of different roles and positions. I think I had advice uh, for folks here um, is that being adaptable and being flexible and always being a person who can step up to fill a role or, or fill a challenge will really open up a lot of opportunities for you uh, in your career. And that's you know, essentially what happened to me. So when my uh, predecessor, Jen Reed, uh, left Gloss, there was an opening for the executive director position. And who, who better, I say, than the person who had you know, also been the janitor and the accountant and uh, everything else in between. So um, that's sort of how I came to be the executive director of Gloss. And that was um, back in uh, January of 2015. OK, so um, a little bit about Gloss. And then I'm going to talk about some of the work that we're doing in Lake Erie and Ohio. Uh, and I actually really like to kind of have a dialogue with everyone here and take the opportunity to think about um, you know, what other types of services and, and data products could GLOSS potentially provide. So we'll get into that a little bit towards the end. So GLOSS, uh, there's one, the Great Lakes Observing System. That's our full title. We are a nonprofit organization. Um, we're a nonprofit, uh, but we're essentially funded through NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, and sort of serve as kind of consider it like a government contractor um, in that we are one of the 11 regions of the IEs program, another acronym, Integrated Ocean Observing System. Um, it's a program that's managed by NOAA, but it's actually a partnership of um, many different federal agencies who are all collecting data in the oceans, coasts, and Great Lakes. Uh, the program was uh, developed recognizing that, hey, you know, aren't these organizations um, you know, shouldn't they all be working together, you know, making sure that they're not duplicating their monitoring efforts, also sharing the data that they're collecting with one another so that they can really, you know, leverage all of that, the activity, you know, that's essentially being paid for by the American taxpayer um, to make sure that they're, you know, using that information to its fullest potential. So um, GLOSS serves as the Great Lakes um, region of, of this national program. And we were really established to support data collection, data management, and data sharing uh, throughout the Great Lakes. Um, so we you know, are essentially taking all this partnership and coordination that's happening at the federal level and trying to make it relevant to our, our region here. So if you think about it, there are universities that are collecting data, state and local government agencies that are collecting data, have you know, all these same counterparts in Canada that are collecting data that is important and useful for, for managing and understanding the lakes, um, and uh, even private uh, sector industries that are, are collecting data out of the lakes, and um, all these cool toys that people have that they're playing with out in the water. And, and what can we do to help coordinate um, these programs and really make the best use of, of all the data that's being collected? Um, so one of the ways that we do this is by literally funding um, some monitoring programs throughout the lakes. And, and really the intention here is to try to supplement uh, the monitoring coverage that already exists through all the federal agencies. Um, this is honestly pretty difficult. I hadn't actually intended on um, crying and complaining about <laughs> our lack of funding, but I will for a minute just because I'm feeling, uh, feeling that way. Um, so of the 11 regions, sadly, the Great Lakes is the lowest funded region in, in this NOAA program. Um, and we are really spreading those resources like peanut butter thin across the region. I'm not sure folks really appreciate how, how large our geography is and how you know, complicated um, it is to monitor all these areas. Um, and so our strategy has really been to try to use these resources as effectively as possible and um, and look for ways to fund these monitoring programs at the appropriate scale. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of our strategies uh, for doing that uh, later on. Um, and then, you know, we're supporting these monitoring programs, bringing in all of the data from our federal partners, you know, under the principle that through open data, we can really, you know, add value. Uh, 
making all of this data integrated, available, and um, being able to use it maybe for different purposes than uh, was originally intended when, when the um, data is being collected. Uh, and I actually might um, jump into the website right now just to go through some of these um, tools for you since um, the Internet's working well, and I'm not always usually able to do that. But essentially, we have three um, main uh, data sites where you can access data. The first is our general data portal. Um, and I would say that that's really a fire hose of, of data in the Great Lakes. You know, most of the uh, data that we're bringing in is real-time data from buoys, like uh, the buoy that you all have out here at Gibraltar Island. Um, but we also have satellite data, model output, um, glider tracks, a whole host of other types of data information. You can get historical data, uh, static data products that have been um, interpreted from you know, satellite imagery or, or through other processes. Um, and so it's really, uh, you know, you have to do a little bit of digging sometimes to get uh, maybe to what you're looking for, but this is really, you know, intended to be, uh, you know, as close to a one-stop shop as you could possibly get for uh, environmental data on the Great Lakes. We also have a more mobile-friendly site, which is glbuoys.gloss.us. You know, we found that a lot of people, especially recreational fishermen, but, but not exclusively <laughs> recreational fishermen, like to just, they actually already know the buoy that they want to get data information from, and they just want to, like, not mess with that big, nasty portal and just get straight to the data from their particular buoy of interest. So this is a, a mobile-friendly version um, that primarily just shows the buoy data and then some other um, you know, interesting data that might be useful to a recreational user, like the weather forecast and, and some other information. I can actually go through that. And then last but not least, we have our HABS data portal. This is something that was actually kind of developed in response to the Toledo event in 2014. There were a lot of uh, different agencies, uh, universities, uh, putting out um, instruments into the water and collecting data. The Ohio EPA actually even gave small grants to all the local water utilities to add um, sounds to their water intakes uh, for monitoring. And the question was like, well, where does all this data go? Like, you know, where's one place that I can find all this information? And everyone just sort of turned and looked at Gloss and said, that should be you. And we're like, all right, let's do it. Um, so kind of really quickly off the side of our desk, we put the HABS portal together and we're actually um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about plans that we have for um, kind of being a little bit more purposeful now in the next iteration of this data product to make sure that we're bringing in all the right types of data and delivering the data in a way that's really useful to water intake managers, researchers, and other people that, that might be interested in this kind of data. Maybe even some of the students here, uh, for instance. Actually, let me jump into the... So this is our home page. Uh, you can really quickly jump to the data portal just by going to this button here. The opening page is more of a catalog view. Um, there are some quick ways that you can, um, you know, kind of refine your search based on um, different types of data that you might be interested. You can also go to the map view. Um, again, uh, it, it's a little bit helpful sometimes to kind of refine first in the catalog and then switch over to kind of looking at a lot of different um, things that might not necessarily show up, like, oh, there's an interesting glider track. Um, um, you know, if you, if you kind of done a, a search first, uh, there is a way to uh, create an, a MyGloss account and log in. This is where you can do a little bit more customization and save some of your preferences so you don't have to always go back and redo your, your search. Um, and then uh, if, if I was logged in, if I'm that you can kind of work here and create a map, save your map, share that map with others, come back to the map when you log in, um, and also for um, our model data. This is 
always the problem with live webinars is that first thing you know, nobody gets much about this. Technical difficulties, we'll talk about that too. Um, but anyway, um, lots of different interesting things to do here. There are some video tutorials, which maybe I should revisit. <laughs> and um, um, it can kind of help you navigate through the, the portal site. The next one um, that I just want to show you. So this is, it's got a lot of white space. That's because, like I said, it's optimized for a mobile device. Um, but this is essentially where you're going to get all of your uh, buoy data. If you know the number or the name of your buoy, um, you can kind of navigate um, on the side here, or you can just sort of scroll down and look to see what's out in the water. If something isn't um, uh, transmitting data in real time, uh, you know, you'll get this message currently in the real or sometimes they're not deployed. Um, guys. So um, again, this uh, looks a lot nicer on your uh, mobile phone, but you can see uh, the data that's being collected. There are ways that you can download the data or plot the data. And as I mentioned, um, you've got the weather forecast. Some additional information, and some of this will vary depending on um, the data provider and, and what other information. So it's just some things like some buoys and stuff, depending on the provider that you have on your buoy. <clears throat> and then this is the HAB portal. Um, again, we do have um, some tutorials here to kind of help you navigate through the different features, the plotting. Um, functionality is available and ways that you can see more information about a particular um, feature that you're collecting data. So that's just a quick, a quick run through um, of some of the tools that we have available. And then um, next I'm going to kind of transition into some of the more specific things that uh, we're doing in Lake Erie. And I thought this video would be a nice introduction to some of that. So. Professor Tom Bridgman has been studying the ecology of Lake Erie for 15 years. Today, he and his team of researchers from the University of Toledo are launching a buoy, a virtual floating laboratory, to monitor the water quality and weather about three miles offshore. In Toledo, concentrations of algae, or algal blooms, caused a health emergency in 2014. The algae injected high levels of toxins into the city's water supply, making it unsafe to drink. It's a crisis that could have been averted with data from buoys. When the Toledo water crisis happened, there were no buoys in the water in the area. And so the water treatment plant didn't know that they were having a problem until a large concentration of algae was already in the water plant. If they had had a buoy next to their intake, as they do now, or in Maumee Bay, as they do now, they would have seen it coming and they would have been able to increase their treatment processes in time to prevent that crisis. 90 miles away, Cleveland's water quality manager, Scott Meglin, keeps a close eye on data from that buoy and a network of other buoys and data collection points in Lake Erie's central and western basins. That data is made available online through the Great Lakes Observing System, or GLOSS. The GLOSS network is part of a larger national and global partnership of government, academic, and private observing systems. GLOSS is the center of this data sharing community in the Great Lakes. It collects, organizes, and provides real-time environmental data, as well as forecasts and historical data for all of the Great Lakes. The data is available for free online to everyone, including boaters and recreational users, businesses, scientists, and government officials, such as municipal water managers. We can't get out there, and that's what these buoys do. There are eyes and our, really our mobile laboratory out in the lake where we can't be all the time. Cleveland funds two buoys that are part of the GLOSS data sharing network. 
The gloss data provides Cleveland Water with advanced warning of issues that can impact water quality and water treatment required for the 1.4 million customers it serves. As we look at this data and we see the trending of it, the gloss data in, in particular is uh, an enormous amount of data. And to be able to use that to see these trends and see when something gets outside of the norm, that's when the alarm goes off. Okay, I need to watch something. In Cleveland, one of the concerns is hypoxia, or so-called dead zones, that can occur in the middle of Lake Erie. Hypoxia can cause odor or taste issues and an increase in dissolved metals in the water. Once we get an understanding of how Lake Erie moves, not only surface currents, but currents throughout the lake water column, that becomes more important to us as we begin to understand the dynamics of Lake Erie and how to predict hypoxic events. For the 34 million people who depend on the Great Lakes, the data Gloss collects from its network of partners is critical. From saving lives and protecting property to enabling better long-term monitoring of important natural resources, Gloss is transforming the way we interact with and manage the Great Lakes. The volume of water in those five lakes together, that's 20% of the world's fresh water, is sitting right here in our backyard. What an amazing, amazing resource we have. And we shouldn't take it for granted. I don't think of it as just our water. I think of it as the planet's water. We're, we happen to live here, but we're stewards of the Great Lakes for everyone on the planet. Gloss is proud to contribute to that stewardship, providing the data and the data tools to help improve safety enhance the economy of the region, and protect our environment. Specifically for the city of Cleveland. 
We also use uh, grant funding to add a buoy here right near their Morgan intake to monitor the conditions closer to the water intake. And then um, we're actually contracting the service out to a private company called Limnotech, and they were able to leverage that uh, to uh, secure a buoy with this wind development company, Leadco. Um, so Leadco sort of chipped in, and now we have three buoys in this area that are all, you know, reporting data to GLOSS, all serve as an information resource for the city of Cleveland, and they've actually made some pretty significant changes to the way that they're treating the water in response to this hypoxia event. Um, now, the uh, low dissolved oxygen levels you know, and the hypoxia itself is not necessarily a public health risk in the way a harmful algal bloom is. It's not, it doesn't have a toxicity issue related to it. Um, but just the taste and odor issues alone are enough for the city of Cleveland to say, you know, we need to be uh, managing this proactively. Um, so the, the, and once the initial grant funding ran out for this buoy, uh, we actually entered into a service agreement with the city of Cleveland. And now they pay an annual what they call data subscription fee. So they're essentially you know, paying for the data that's coming from these buoys. And this is one of the ways that we've tried to be creative about extending or expanding the monitoring coverage across the Great Lakes. Um, but being realistic about what we can actually expect from the federal government at this point. <laughs> so using, you know, maybe some federal grant money to capitalize the buoys, but then, you know, getting a local stakeholder to chip in for the continued um, operations and maintenance of, of those assets. <clears throat> um, and then the, really that, that entire project and then the data from those buoys kind of inspired us to uh, think about how could we forecast hypoxic conditions um, in the lake. And so this is a project that actually is being led by um, Noah Glural again and uh, with the Cooperative Institute for Great Lakes Research. Um, and I think this might be an animation. Maybe. Yeah. It's not fun, it won't move. But essentially, you know, trying to uh, predict, uh, you know, where these hypoxic areas are and how, where they might move, um, potentially closer to the water intake. So this is kind of interesting. So, so really the indicator here for hypoxia is the low dissolved oxygen, these dark blue areas. And these dots right here are where the water intakes are. So you can see that, you know, probably you wouldn't be uh, you know, so worried if you were drying in the water from somewhere else, but because they're drying in the water from these very low depths, they just happen to be hitting these pockets of hypoxic water. Um, and then, uh, let's see what I, oh, so, you know, I talked a little bit about how we uh, developed this HABS portal, why we developed the HABS portal, um, you know, it really was uh, like an immediate reaction to the needs of the stakeholders uh, immediately after the Toledo crisis. Um, but we recently received a grant um, to, uh, you know, essentially improve this, thinking about, you know, aside from some of these real-time data sources, what other data could we be bringing into this portal um, that would be informative or help provide more contextual information about um, HABS issues, the HABS bulletin is, is one of the things that we're, we're looking at potentially um, bringing in, and um, also for the purchase of one of these environmental sample processors. So I don't know how many of you have heard of the lab in a can, and um, Noah likes to see you um, brag about it, because <laughs> it is very exciting um, that we have this, but um, they were just operating one for a while. Uh, they recently got some GLRI funding, I think, to add another one, and now we're um, paying for a third. So there'll be three of these. They can essentially, uh, you know, sample the water and um, process it in real time, um, to, or in you know, sort of quicker time, I guess, near real time, to you know, understand um, precisely uh, what types of um, algae are in the water and, and if they're the toxic. So this is kind of exciting. 
Um, uh, I also wanted to mention here that in the past we have also provided mini grants to the University of Toledo and Heidelberg University, not necessarily to directly support their monitoring efforts, but to help them with their capacity to make that data available online. So that's another element you know, that we see ourselves supporting in terms of the data collection, the data management, and the data sharing. You know, maybe you know, the data collection is not a problem for you. It's you know, having the, either the staff support or the uh, hardware infrastructure to uh, make that data available on the web. And that's another um, uh, way that we can help support for you. Um, we also uh, provide database management support to the Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observing System. Uh, this is uh, a, a program that I know uh, Doug is familiar with. Um, and you guys have a beautiful carpet of acoustic receivers <laughs> here across Lake Erie. You're very lucky. Um, but essentially, this is where you put a, a tag and a fish. Um, the receivers are able to pick up the um, signal from those tags, and uh, researchers are using this to study a, a lot of different types of uh, fish species, their, their movement uh, across the lake. And, and we don't actually uh, manage the um, program, but we do the data, the back end database management support. So, helping uh, the researchers run more automated queries on the data, doing some initial quality control uh, on the data so that that's not something, um, so that, you know, essentially like a computer program can help you do that instead of you having to do it all manually. And those, so those are some other types of services that we provide. Uh, and then coming soon, this is actually a picture of Wisconsin and Lake Michigan, not Ohio and Lake Erie, but um, we recently uh, started a contract with uh, the USGS, uh, who is leading a group of um, federal partners and academic partners who are all doing different bottom mapping activities, whether it's bathymetric surveys, sonar, lidar um, surveys, even you know diving and other types of um, habitat mapping, you know, maybe with um, like an autonomous underwater vehicle, um, and looking for ways to coordinate um, all of you know those folks that are doing um, that type of monitoring. How can we um, integrate these different uh, you know data types that are being collected and develop some you know comprehensive um, bottom mapping products for people to use. And this is sort of um, initiated because of um, uh, the National Marine Sanctuary Program had an application for um, new sanctuaries, and uh, the city of Sheboygan um, and, and some of the folks along this uh, coastline in Wisconsin were trying to get this area or, um, designated as a national marine sanctuary because there are a lot of shipwrecks in that area. So that was kind of where this partnership started in terms of trying to collect all of this data and information to sort of make the case for why that area should be a marine sanctuary. Um, but now it just sort of steamrolled and it's going to be uh, a basin-wide exercise. So I'm hopeful that if any of you all are either interested in that type of work or have some data to contribute that you might be interested in um, participating in this project with the USGS. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we do have a grant to look at the HABS portal, but we're also sort of in a process of, you know, just kind of evaluating the products and services that we've been providing and thinking about what can we do better to serve you all in the future. You know, truthfully, our mission is just to coordinate these activities. It's not necessarily directed towards a specific policy initiative or specific management directive. And I'm not, we're not just doing this because of HABs. We're not just doing this because, uh, you know, NOAA introduced some new policy and told us to do this. Really, you all are our motivation for, for why we do what we do and how we prioritize what we do. Um, so, you know, I just have some questions for you all to, to contemplate as you like either play with some of the, the portals that we have or think about 
um, some of the different monitoring um, or, or data needs that you have. You know, how can we improve um, your user experience on our website and how we deliver the data? Um, what other services can we provide you all as data providers and data users? Um, and where are there other opportunities uh, where we can coordinate and improve um, you know, the efficiency of how we're all working together? Um, so some ideas for how you can get involved with WASP. Uh, of course, we would love if you have some data and you want to share it. Um, perhaps, um, you know, as in the case of the bottom mapping uh, group, uh, there's a need to coordinate um, some information or, or help publicizing um, the data. Uh, certainly, we can help with that. Um, using GLOSS data management services, it seems like you can't uh, write a grant proposal nowadays without including a data management plan. And um, uh, I forgot to mention earlier, but uh, part of how we came to be one of the 11 regions of the ICE program is that we went through something called a certification process. So our data management um, processes are actually certified by the federal government and will actually check off um, pretty much every box I think that there is in the data management plan requirements for your NSF grants, your NOAA grants, and I don't know, I think maybe a handful of other um, agencies now have these data management plan requirements. So you should talk to us if you um, are having a hard time completing that data management plan part of your grant proposal. <laughs> Um, uh, speaking of proposals, proposal opportunities, um, you know, is there a need to expand or leverage existing monitoring capacity, kind of like in the case of what we did with the City of Cleveland? Um, do you need to access multiple data streams for modeling or analytics? This is another area where we would like to help, or maybe we already know some folks um, that we can connect you with. Um, you know, that might be good partners for a proposal opportunity. Um, and then we're always looking for feedback on our products and services. So, like I said, you know, really we're here in the service for you all. And so if you have some feedback about the usefulness of a certain product or tool, or maybe there's some data that you really need um, that seems like something Gloss should have but we don't, um, we, we really love to hear that feedback because it just helps us you know, be of better service to you all. And then um, I just wanted to talk a little bit like at a higher level. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of the phrase big data. I'm sure all of you have. Um, but I think, you know, it's kind of like a buzzword, um, but it's sort of the world that we're operating in um, at Gloss. And I think, you know, really the most uh, useful application for the term big data now is uh, how um, marketing companies will like mine your personal information so that they can advertise to you more effectively and, and, and make more money, right? Um, and you would think that in a field like environmental management or science that um, we would want to be at the forefront of how to you know, use a lot of big data sources to help inform our management and policy better. Um, but I, I don't think that we're nearly as far and sophisticated as marketing companies <laughs> are using our data to advertise to us. Uh, I know that there are a lot of efforts out there right now um, that are trying to tackle this maybe for a certain um, management issue or, or, you know, around a certain um, environmental topic. And, and I really hope that GLOSS can help support all of these efforts. Um, but I actually think that all of these are just scratching the surface probably at, at what we could be doing. And so I would also sort of challenge um, you all to think about, um, you know, how could we be using the data that already exists out there better? Um, what you know, how, how can we connect some of these dots just to help make the information easier to understand, easier to get to the general public, you know, use it to help affect uh, behavior changes and, um, and, and just take advantage of this, this wealth of data that already exists. Um, sorry, this came out so small. <laughs> um, so, 
I, I guess I'll just kind of end with, you know, what do you think we could be doing better and or different to more fully engage you with GLOSS? Uh, what other trends do you think are important to consider as we plan for GLOSS's future and think about, you know, changes that we might make to our products and services? And, um, you know, what current services and products should we stop doing and why? And, and what ones should we keep doing and why? Um, probably some of you maybe aren't familiar enough with GLOSS or don't, or don't um, you know, work with GLOSS enough maybe to, to feel like you could answer these questions. But these are just some of the things that we're going to be thinking about um, in the next uh, year or so as we're thinking about our funding priorities for, for the next five years. So. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's actually part of where we're trying to expand our services. So, um, you know, I think we sort of recognize that, um, I don't know, it, it's, you know, the organization is, is young. It just kind of got established in 2008. So it's been about 10 years in existence. And I think where we started was maybe more of like um, just serving a small group of researchers, and it's really broadened to like serving a wider group of potential stakeholders. So, but we realize that a lot of the utility of what we're able to do comes with training and outreach to people. So I think that that's something um, that we have more plans to do to think about. Not just me saying like, there's some tutorial videos on YouTube, go check it out, but like actually preparing like real tutorials and taking that show on the road for people. Um, but also, I think um, the, really, honestly, the bad thing about portals is that the minute you develop one, it's obsolete. <laughs> like, and so it just it's another challenge of like just trying to constantly keep up with technology, how people are using and receiving information. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's another part of the training thing is like we've got to. I think we've got to try to get ahead of where the trends are and how people are using data information and, um, and use that to sort of inform the changes to our products. I will, sorry, I'm going to go on a little bit. I'll actually say that we've gotten a lot more sophisticated too with our use of um, web analytics and um, learning how people are using our website. There's a very clear split between mobile and desktop use. And so, um, Mobile users tend to be more general public recreational users. Uh, oddly enough, Google Ads drives a lot of traffic to that site. And whereas desktop is like more sort of, um, I guess, data savvy professional like researchers uh, who, you know, maybe use a lot more different kinds of data um, on a regular basis. So that's also sort of informing that as well. <coughs> No, you can, you could go, I'm sure Ohio State probably puts the buoy data up somewhere on their site, right? Yeah, and um, so, so the thing is like you could get NOAA data at a NOAA website, you could get USGS data at a USGS website, you could get Ohio State's data at Ohio State's website. Um, and hopefully the efficiency here is that rather than going to all those sites individually, if you wanted to see more types of data, you could go to GLOSS for a broader um, suite of data. Are they like Yeah. Um, I think that so, for instance, I know a lot of the people who operate buoys send their, their data to a NOAA um, program called the National Data Buoy Center, um, and the acronym there's NDBC. NDBC actually doesn't bring in all of the data parameters.
parameters because they have certain quality control um, processes that they like to run. And some uh, parameters like chlorophyll, I don't think they have a standard for it, so they just won't bring it in. Um, so there, in some cases, there, you, know, you might be able to get data at GLOSS that you might not be able to get there, or vice versa. You know, it might be um, like someone has a webcam on their buoy, and they're not necessarily sharing that webcam data with GLOSS. You can only get the webcam feed at their website, so it varies. <clears throat> have thermistor strings. Um, I don't think that the wind uh, development company's buoy has a thermistor string. So I, I think the answer is for two of them, yeah. <laughs>
functionality could we add to maybe an app, like set up an alert, um, that might be more useful to someone like that. So that's kind of the division of activity that we're looking at. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. That was going to be kind of taking some of the comments that I was going to make. Is, uh, you said a little bit about having some data analytics or some analytics data that you can use. I, I haven't you are super user. We have, yeah, I mean, it's really funny how, like, the the range of, you know, people and what kinds of, what they're interested in looking at and how they want to look at it. You know, some people want things, like, just super interpreted for them and they don't want to have to think about it. And other people just give me the raw data and let me play with it myself. So it's, it's a wide range. Yeah, that's what you said. I mean, that's yeah. what But, I mean, yeah, I de we, we want to do that. And so the thing for us is just to think about how can we do that efficiently. Sorry, did I interrupt you? No, I don't know. I would say I think I understand. <laughs> one, I guess my one comment would be, you know, one, one thing that's really helpful, as, we as Alice and I were playing with find the, the Google Sheets and the um, Google Sheets, and one thing I think I meditated Sure. No. Awesome. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. So <clears throat> I was looking at the website and I saw it has like the turbidity um, and some of the different things that are out of the water. Would you be able to take that data and put it into a graph form that just shows what colors of light are getting into the depths of the water? Um, like say from a fish fishing standpoint? Uh huh. Uh, Well, we would need to have, um, I, I guess I don't know the exact answer to that question, but I guess it would depend on what kind of data was available for that particular location. We do have a lot of anglers asking us for the temperature profiles. Yeah, and um, I'm sure that they'd probably love it if they could just see that tagged fish swimming around. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so there is a more complicated tool if you wanted to um, query some of the model output. So for whatever reason, the model was being funky with me and it wasn't working. But um, you can query uh, water temperature um, and, and get the temperature profiles. It's like a little funky how you do it, but it's called the um, point query tool. And so if you knew the particular location that you were looking for, um, I think right now you have to query every step individually, but we did do a workaround for a guy who was bugging us and said, I just want the whole thing. So um, maybe I'll give you my card and I can see if I can give you that, um, that workaround that we gave to other guys. <laughs> 